So you were IBM in the 1980s. You were the most profitable company in the world. You control 60% of the mainframe market and have just introduced the PC of the decade. Your executives are projecting a revenue of $100 billion by 1990. Everything is going right for you, and it seems nothing can stop you. But in a surprise turn of events, as the new decade hits, you start posting losses. Your sales start declining rapidly, and in 1992, you post the then biggest loss in U.S. corporate history. Many experts predict your end, and even Bill Gates gives you another seven years of survival. So now you start racking your brain, trying to understand how something so good crashed so quickly, and more importantly, how the hell to get out of it. This is the story of how IBM came back from the biggest loss in U.S. corporate history. It's time to start introspecting. As IBM, you have a really rich history dating back to 1911. But the problem had to be recent. You couldn't have really survived seven to eight decades with a major issue in the company. And after a long and deep look, you find one of its roots emerging in the 1960s. In 1964, IBM had introduced its most revolutionary product, the IBM 360 mainframe, that completely changed how businesses worked. IBM brings you that system. This is System 360. The task wasn't an easy one, as by the end of the project, IBM's initially projected investment of $675 million was stretched to $5 billion. It was a gamble with nothing guaranteed at the end. But with the risk came the rewards. By 1970, six years after its initial release, IBM controlled about 70% of the computer market with its mainframes. IBM's revenue swelled up to $8.6 billion in 1971. But this utter dominance of IBM is what led to its downfall. There was a major issue in the computer market of the 60s. See, when the computer industry emerged, there weren't a lot of people or companies who understood their work. Hence, the computer companies had to do everything themselves. They built their own chips, hardware, operating software, applications, etc. There were no vendors in the market who could help them out. For example, vendors like Microsoft, whose main focus is providing operating software and each company built computers in their own way. Hence, there was no compatibility between products of different companies. In such an environment, if you played your cards right, you could create the most perfect situation for any business, a monopoly. And luckily, IBM played its cards exactly right. See, IBM too sold its mainframes in an integrated package. All the software, storage, and additional hardware would accompany it. So as an IBM customer, if you needed anything, you had to go back to them. Some issue with the system? Pay IBM to repair it. Need a new application? Pay IBM to make it. Hardware damaged? Pay IBM the price quoted by them to fix it. And let's say you wanted to shift from IBM to another vendor? What do you do? Nothing, because right now your entire business is dependent on IBM. All your existing data is on these IBM models. Your applications developed by IBM only work on IBM computers. Even your employees are trained to work on IBM applications and computers only. Shifting to another vendor would mean literally throwing everything out of the window. Acquiring new hardware, developing new software from the base up, training your employees again, and somehow finding a way to transfer your existing data to the new computers. If your business was in any way dependent on these IBM computers, then you were completely at the mercy of IBM. Well, you might be thinking, how is that a problem for IBM? As IBM, you have the perfect monopoly, with big businesses depending on you. You are churning profits each month, and your competitors cannot hold a candle to you. What could possibly hurt you in such a situation? While IBM knew nothing outside the company could harm them, they didn't know they would be the ones driving the stake through their own hearts. Look, I don't think IBM invented the System 360 with an aim to create a monopoly. But when they did realize they had a monopoly, felt the power they had, they let it go to their minds. The company was completely risk-averse. No matter what they did, how they treated their customers, how bureaucratic and complacent they became, they were still making billions. When you have so much power but no one to keep a check on you, you change. IBM's culture, which up till now had been focused on superior customer service and creating revolutionary products, started becoming stodgy. The company's dominance let it keep its high prices and rarely update products. The whole company itself had shifted its mindset. Once an inventor focused on solving customer needs, was now a bureaucratic machine just working on churning profits from its mainframe business. 
This continued until the 80s when a new trend started emerging. By this time, IT was a highly profitable industry and new companies focused on a single area started emerging. Microsoft worked on software, Intel on chips, Compaq on building PCs. Customers, unlike before, had the option of choosing the chips they used, hardware, software, applications, everything. They did not have to rely on a single vendor. This started disrupting IBM's monopoly. So what did IBM do in response? Fearing a loss in revenue, IBM kept their prices high to ensure their profits weren't reduced. They were just focused on generating revenue and were destroying their most important asset, the customers. This led to a continuous decline in sales and market share, and eventually, in 1992, the most profitable company in the world in 85 reported the biggest loss in U.S. corporate history. So after that long session of introspection, you as IBM know what the problem is. Your internal culture has become miserable, which has created some major problems for your company. The first step you take is firing your CEO, John Akers. Clearly, he doesn't know the problem with the company. Next step, get a new CEO, capable of changing the entire organization. You approach big CEOs such as John Scully at Apple and Bill Gates at Microsoft, but they don't want to hang out with you and ruin their careers. Meanwhile, something hits you. You've been gunning big tech CEOs since you are a tech company. But is the knowledge of tech really the issue here? You have been the technological hub since the 60s, acquiring the best talent in the industry. Clearly, there isn't a lack of technical knowledge in the company. What you need right now is more of a leader who can show the right path to everyone. So going with your gut and the results provided by your board of directors, you hire Louis V. Gerstner. Gerstner has a successful track record at companies such as American Express and McKinsey & Company. Talking to him, he feels like the exact medicine prescribed by the doctor. But expectedly, everyone else is aghast from the selection. A non-technologist for a hardcore technology company? Experts wave him off and the media start ridiculing Gerstner. People start questioning whether IBM is trying to hasten its end. So all you do now is hope. Hope your gut was right and that Gerstner is equipped for the momentous task ahead of him.